about the book of Nehemiah. Yeah. And, uh, I love the book of Nehemiah. It's uh, rich with church building principles. So that's going to be the title of the series is Nehemiah, the church building series. And I love that period of time in the history of God's people. I believe that is, if God has got a favorite period of time, it's possibly this one. The people's hearts were very pure that they just wanted to go back and rebuild the city. They had been through so much. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a history. You know, you had uh, probably the most significant account in the Old Testament was the Exodus. So Moses takes out about two and a half million Israelites into the desert, hoping to reach the promised land and get this place that would be flowing with milk and honey and be great and awesome. But because they are unfaithful, they wind up wandering for 40 years in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. Even Moses himself dies on Mount Nebo, only looking at the promised land he never quite got to. Yeah. And he asked God for one thing, one final request before he would die. Moses says, please just give the people a leader to take my place. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And God answers that one request and gives him Joshua. Yeah. Yeah. Joshua leads the, this next generation into the promised land. They conquer. It's one of the most triumphant times of all of the history of God's people. And he gives them really one instruction. He says, when you go into the promised land and you conquer these people and I give you all this stuff, just don't become like the people in the land. And they could not obey that. They started to worship all these foreign gods like the Baals and the Asherahs and all these things. And then time after time, because they turned away from God, slavery came into their life, oppression came into their life. And so God, again, wanting to save His people, He starts to raise up judges, which are just leaders. You had, you know, uh, Jephthah and Gideon and Deborah and Samuel was the final of all these judges, people who would call the people back to God. And whenever that judge was alive, the people would give back to God, but then the judge would die and the people would turn away from God again. Finally, Samuel, the last judge, the people again wanting to be like all the nations around them. Just like, you know, everybody wants to be like everybody else. They say... Give us a king like all the other people have a king. We want a, we want a human king. And Samuel felt super rejected by that. And God said, hey, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. See, because up until that time, Israel was what you call a theocracy. They believed that God was leading their nation. And that God used People use spiritual leaders like Moses and the judges and Samuel to govern their people. Hallelujah. But now they wanted to switch to a different type of government. Where they would have a human king and it would become an absolute monarchy. Wow. Yeah. And God says, that's what you want. I will let you have it. But he will rule over you. And you'll have to do everything he says. And we enter the time of the kings. Yeah. And this has, uh, it's a, a rise and a fall from one generation to the next. You had one good king to lead him back to God, and then three kings would lead him away, and back and forth, up and down, all around it goes for hundreds of years, to finally God has enough. And he says, now there's going to come this people from the north called the Babylonians. And they're going to take you into captivity because of your sin. Jeremiah prophesies, he says, you'll be there 70 years. Whoa. And 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem. He takes the most prominent Baptists into exile in Babylon, one of three deportations. Yep. And exactly 70 years later, 536 B.C., fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah, Cyrus conquers Babylon and is the first king of Persia. Yep. And what he does immediately, fulfilling the prophecy, he says, all you guys, go home. I'm going to set all the captives free. And what's incredible is to this day, there's something called the Cyrus Cylinder in the British Museum in London that records the whole tale of Cyrus setting the captives free to go back and rebuild their temples. And this is where we get the account of Ezra. 
Ezra, there was millions in slavery at this time. Ezra, but they got comfortable. It's supposed to symbolize us today that, that we live in a world that's enslaved to its sin, but it's very comfortable there. And so even though there was millions in slavery, only 50,000 wanted to go back and rebuild the temple for God. They go back and rebuild it, and after a very long time, we get the account of Nehemiah. And we're going to pick it up in Nehemiah 1, in verse 1. The title of my first edition of this series is, The Response to the Bad News. Come on, bro. It says, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and distress and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. You know, an incredible account here by Nehemiah. And it says that he gets this news back from Jerusalem. His brother. He says, hey, how's it going? It's not good. It's not good. The people who went back during the time of Ezra... They're in disgrace. The city's burnt. The walls are burnt. The gates are burnt. It's not good. And he gets this bad news. You know, this reminds me of myself when I made a decision in 2009 to lead the Lord. I went on the LA mission team in 2007. We were, we were bent on conquest. We were going to change the world. Sadly, because I went through my own difficulties and didn't see God through it, I decided to leave God. And then one faithful day I said, you know what, I've got to just go out to church and I've got to see what's going on with the kingdom. And I think like Nehemiah, he expected good news. He expected it to be good. And I remember going out to the south region, the little south region that had to be planted like two or three yeah. times. On, and I remember going, I saw Sarah there, and Mike Patterson was there, and Kip was there, because when Kip's in the region, it's because things aren't going too good. And so Kip was there, and I kind of was like, really? This is, this is it. This is, what, this is what's happened to the 42 that came down on the mission team? I expected it to be greater, to be the news, to be better. And I think for the first time, I saw the kingdom the way Nehemiah saw it here. He said, these are my people, and they're in a battle, and the walls are burnt, the city's destroyed, and I wanted to go and stay in Babylon. How can I leave my people there? And it broke my heart. I said, I've got to get back to God. I've got to get back to Jerusalem. I've got to get back to God's people. I've got to help rebuild the wall. Yeah. And I got restored, made May uh, 22nd, 2010. Wow. Isaiah 26 says, We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. See, we know that the New Testament was a spiritual foreshadowing of what happened physically under the New Covenant. So in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, you actually had a physical city of God. And that's where the Lord was. And you had physical walls that protected the people of God. But that's different now. Now we have the spiritual city of God is called the church. And salvation is the wall that keeps us safe. Yeah. What is salvation? That every person makes a personal decision to become a sold out disciple of Jesus and gets baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Come on. That's the, that's the wall. That makes it safe in here. Yeah, on, That's the wall that is high that Satan can't get around. That allows us to raise our kids in this safe place. Yeah, that allows us to find that special man or woman to get married. And then we're not a part of what's going out outside of those walls. Right. Yeah. And it's on us to keep that wall high and to keep that wall strong. Yeah. You know, we need to rebuild the walls of commitment in modern day Christianity. Come on, Come on. The walls of commitment are burned 
and broken. We've been sold in our generation that Christianity is about sincerity. Go to church, say a prayer, be sincere, and hey, God understands. I mean, come on. Isn't the all-knowing, all-loving God understand that we're Americans? I think God's American too. And surely He understands your need to put money first. And surely He understands your need and your schedule. Surely he understands that work's got to come first and the family's got to come first and all these things. Sure, sure God understands that. Wow. He understands that you're a student and you idolize college. Wow. On, and so you put that first in your life. Yeah. And he understands your sincerity. Though you're completely uncommitted. Wow. Let me tell you what. God does not understand. Yeah. He does not understand sincerity. Come on. He understands Commitments. Look over here at Luke 9. Luke 9 and verse 23. It says, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose his life. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? See, Jesus gives us a very different message here. He says, hey, actually, if you, anyone wants to follow me, so anyone is everyone, that includes us today, right. thousands yeah. of years later. Yeah. He says, if you want to follow me, you must be willing to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. So actually, when we are not sincere, that when we are sincere, we have to deny that right. and follow Jesus. On, See, if I was to follow my sincerities, I'd be doing something very different this morning. <laughs> you know, it's the New Year's, and everybody has all these vows for the New Year. I'm going to yeah. get on a diet, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to get in shape, yeah. spiritually or physically, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And whenever you put forth a vow, or a commitment to something, what comes? Self-denial. Yeah. I would sincerely like to eat like two donuts for breakfast this morning. I'm sincere about that. I'm good about it. But my commitment is going to supersede my sincerity. So I'm going to deny myself. So anytime there is great commitment, self-denial is going to come into play. And here Jesus is calling us not to sincerity. In fact, he says, deny your sincerities. You've got to be willing to follow me. Yeah. Now, when someone first enters into this type of great commitment, Come on. you know what it feels like? Yeah. Death. Yeah. That's true. It feels like death. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. My life has been called for me. And you are right. Because yeah. I cannot do everything I just want to do anymore. Right. He says, if you're unwilling to enter this type of covenant, on, this bro. type of commitment, this type of deal with Jesus Christ, you cannot follow Jesus. Yeah. But we've been sold sincerity. Yeah. And we've got to rebuild the walls of commitment. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. What makes me a Christian is I'm committed to God no matter what happens to my life. Even if it caused me my death, I'm committed to God. It's an ancient discipline, an ancient call that our first century brothers and sisters answered, and we've got to answer it in the first 21st century. Are you with me this morning? We have to rebuild the walls of world evangelism. Come on, bro. The world needs to be evangelized. Yes. We are what you call a restoration movement. We're not a reformation movement. So we're not trying to reform anything. We're not trying to do a new spin on Christianity. We don't think that it's evolved into something new. We need to kind of adapt to it or anything like that. That's not what we believe. We believe that there was one church that was recorded in the New Testament, and that's in the book of Acts. And they had it absolutely right, completely. And since then, we've seen one splinter into thousands and thousands and thousands of different denominations of Christianity. We believe this is broken, and we need to restore it. 
We need to take it back. We need to get back to what God originally called us to do. And what he called us to do was to evangelize the nations in a generation. Yeah. Let's turn over to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. In verse 18. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority has been given to me, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always, to the very end of the age. The words, all nations, are in the Bible almost 200 times. From the beginning, from Genesis to Revelation, God made it very clear that His name will be great among the nations. 1 Timothy 2 verse 3 said, God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Colossians 1 28 says, every creature under heaven heard the gospel in the first century. They evangelized the world. About 30 years after this is recorded in Matthew, Colossians is written and they said they got the job done. Yeah. They were a global movement that had, was having a global impact. Yeah. It was powerful. It literally changed the world so much that in Acts 17, verse 6, he says, these are the men who have come here, and they've turned the world upside down. Yeah. They changed things so completely. You go, wow, what we used to value, we don't value anymore. The way we used to think, we don't think anymore. The way we used to live, we don't live anymore. These guys have turned the world upside down. Come on. That is a broken wall today. Yeah. People go to church and go home. Yeah. Go to church and go home. Yeah. Go to church and go home. Yeah. Try and be good. Yeah. That's not the, the church we see in the Bible. Yeah. Every year, more than 4,000 churches close their doors. And every year about 1,000 new churches are started. So that's about 3,000 in the deficits. And not that even the 1,000 that are restarted are even any answer to the problem anyways. Most of them are some new split spin on Christianity and let's try and baptize Christianity into the 21st century. The 90% of the churches that are still around are declining in membership. The 10% that actually do grow, grow at a snail's pace about 1% to 3% a year. That's usually a member's children when they come of age. They say, hey, you're 13 now and you got to kind of do the same thing your big sister and your big brother did. And let's go ahead and get you to say a prayer. Let's put you on the roll. What do you say, sonny? And they put them on the roll. <laughs> the walls of world evangelism are burned and broken. And it's on us to rebuild them. The walls of discipling are destroyed. Again, it's turned into a meeting. We don't see a Jesus in the apostle setting where people are being taught, rebuked, correct, and trained. So they become the powerful men and women that God wants that he can use all over the world. We've seen it be turned into like Ned Flanders. That the modern day Christian is a 30-something you know, simpleton who's out of touch and just has this blind faith and for some reason he believes in Jesus because his daddy told him it was good. Right. Sure. There's not a, a power. These were people that were changing the world. Yeah. They were revolutionaries. Yeah. They were ready to answer any question anybody had for the faith that they held. Yeah. They were intellectuals. Yeah. Paul said, bring on the scholar. Bring on the philosopher. I'm ready to go. Come on, bro. And we've seen this wall burned and broken. Let's look at Acts 4. Come on. Come on. Jesus walked in Galilee. He chose the lowest of the lows just so we'd have no excuse for all time. He took fishermen and zealots and tax collectors and these people that possibly didn't even know how to read. And he said, hey, I'm going to take these guys so that I can shame the wise. Let's go. And I can show that with anybody, if you're willing to disciple one another and really hold each other to that standard in the scriptures, that even the lowest of people, even no matter what they are or where they come from, they can become powerful, powerful men and women of God. Come on, bro. After we see 
this report and ask for it. Come on, bro. Come on. Let's pick it up in verse 8. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He said, the stone the builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which you must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note. They had been with Jesus. Wow. This is the power of discipling. Yeah. You can take anybody who's willing to lay their life down for, to get trained in the scriptures and they become powerful people. On, Here they stand before the Sanhedrin facing death. And they go, hey guys, if you want to persecute us about doing good to somebody, know this. It happened in the name of Jesus. You guys crucified him. And by the way, he's the only way that you can get right with God. Wow. What do you tell them? You're lost. You guys are lost, and you need to get your life right with Jesus. They go, oh my gosh, these guys are fishermen. They're untrained, ordinary people. They're speaking like this. You know, they were with Jesus. Okay. He discipled them. Yeah. He made these guys. See, they thought that they'd kill Jesus and their movement would end. Now they just realized there was just 12 more Jesuses. Wow. <laughs> just 12 more. Wow. And Jesus said, you guys would do even greater things than I, and they did even greater things. Yep. See, that's what discipling does. Is it takes ordinary people, and you can do anything even greater than Jesus Christ. But this apostle setting is lost <coughs> in our 21st century Christian churchianity. And people go, hey, man, you guys are really in each other's lives. You're kind of nosy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. We're in each other's lives. Yeah. That's right. We actually expect each other to live out the commitment we said when Jesus was Lord. Yeah. And we're willing to disciple one another to hold on to that commitment. No matter what it takes. This is a wall that's been broken. Some people go, oh, you're too much in people's lives. Man, isn't that controlling? No, I say it's love. Yeah. I say it's family. Yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah. What would you do if your physical sister or something started to stray from what you knew would help her in life? Wow. That's why they have a show called Intervention. Because yeah. <laughs> as the family sees something wrong, we've got to intervene. We've got to get in there. We've got to help them because we love them. Yeah. We do to the church. Oh, that's too much. Yeah. I would ask you to get into the scriptures and look at one like Hebrews 3.12. Let's look there. Yeah. 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 Hebrews 3.12. It says, see to it, brothers and sisters, okay. that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. Mm -hmm. So it's everyone's responsibility in the church to make sure that everyone in the church makes it all the way. Yep. That they continue in the same confidence. So a really who just got baptized yeah. is like, yeah. it's on all of us to make sure that a really stays just as fired up today than the day that she enters the kingdom of God. Amen? Yeah. That's on all of us. Yeah. See, we don't score until one actually makes it to heaven. Amen. That's what we score one for the good guys. Awesome. And it's this wall has been broken. Look over here at Ezekiel 13. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, Jason. Ezekiel 13 in verse 1. It 
It says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are now prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Son of the Lord says, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirits and have seen nothing. Your prophets, O Israel, are like jackals among ruins. You have not gone out to the breaks in the wall to repair it for the house of Israel, so it will stand firm in the day of battle on the day of the Lord's. Drop down to verse 10. Because they lead my people astray, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Therefore, I tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is going to fall. This is the world we live in. Yep. A flimsy wall that's covered in whitewash. That's why we have to say, oh, you're just trying to church that up. You're just trying to church that up, make it look good. Because it's whitewash. Had it look good on the outside. But if you look at those homes, it would make you nothing but sad. This is the burnt wall that we live in. And what Nehemiah did, as we're going to see as we get back into Nehemiah 1, is he took responsibility. Yeah. Look back at Nehemiah 1. Come on, bro. And that's my right. second point. Take responsibility. Okay. Come on, bro. Teach us. In verse 5. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant of love with those who love Him and obey His commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have now obeyed your commands, decrees, and laws. You gave your servant Moses. See, Nehemiah took responsibility for where he was at and where the people were at. You know, when I got restored in 2010, it's something that I had to come to grips with. Is I didn't fall away because of my bad circumstance, though it was bad. I was married, went through a divorce, there was unfaithfulness. My wife had fallen away. I was crushed. But that's not why I fell away. I didn't fall away because of my circumstance, because God never promised me a great circumstance. Right. In fact, if you read the Bible, you're going to see people who went through some of the worst of circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. I fell away because I did not take spiritual responsibility yeah. of where I was at. And I just did not have deep convictions about the Bible. Yeah. That's it. That's why. No other reason. I had to take full responsibility for where I was at before God and understand there was no one's fault but my own for why I was there. And until I did that, I could not move forward. There's a saying, responsibility is the price of freedom. Yeah. A lot of people never get free because they're never willing to just own it where they're at. It was their parents' fault. It was, it was uh, right. their leader's fault. Or somebody hurt them. Or somebody did this. Or somebody did that. Or financial situation. Their wife or their husband. Somebody else. But not me. Somebody did it to me. We're so easy to become the victim in life. Yeah. Yeah. We're so scared to just point that right at ourselves. Right. And go, you know what? It was no one's fault of mine. Yeah. I had a divorce. I didn't leave my wife. I, that's me. I was the one who was in sin. Wow, Me and my father's household, and there was no one left to blame. Wow. When I finally got that, I was able to gain freedom. You know, here he takes full responsibility, and it makes all the difference in the world. One person who's willing to take responsibility can change the world. Okay. He says, you know, it was my fault, and now I'm going to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. You know, I remember, uh, I always wanted freedom. You know, when you're young, you want freedom? 
And so when I was 18, I was like, I wasn't like the type of person who was going to stay around. I was like, wow, you know. Soon I was 18, I moved to San Diego. And the, quickly I found out there was a price of freedom. It's called responsibility. Yeah. I just started paying my own bills and pay my own gas, my own insurance, and I own this. And I got my dad to pay a couple things still for me. You know, and there was a price of freedom. A lot of people don't like the price of freedom, so they go back home. That's why, sadly, today, 30%, 36% of adults from the age 18 to 31 are still living at home. Because we don't like responsibility. We'd much rather just lean on others and blame them. You know, people just don't want to accept it. You know, here's something that is comforting. I'm the problem, and I'm the solution. Come on, bro. Nehemiah understood that he was the problem, and that he was the solution. Come on, bro. There's a very scary world out there. Yeah. And we're the problem, or we're the solution. That's it. Turn to Matthew 9. Come on, bro. In verse 35. Matthew 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers in a harvest field. He called the twelve disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, and to heal every disease and sickness, and he sent them out. Come on. Jesus goes through all the worlds, and he sees all the problems with the worlds. And he says, here's the solution. Men and women... We're willing to be true disciples, accept responsibility, and go and change it. That's the only solution. That's the only way to fix this lost world. You know, a couple things that happened yesterday. 2,400 divorces happened yesterday. 28 people died due to drunk driving yesterday. 5,760 children were orphaned yesterday. Yesterday, a man walks into a mall in Florida and starts shooting. Yesterday, a woman in Philadelphia took her little baby and put it in the middle of the road and set it on fire. This is just yesterday. And it probably happened again today, and it'll happen again tomorrow. Who's going to take responsibility? Come on, bro. Who's going to say, we will go change this? Imagine the divorces that could have been saved if somebody would have just shared their faith with this couple. Maybe at just the last moment where they're going to call it quits yeah. and say, here, this is how you restore your marriage. You've got to become a disciple. You've got to become a disciple. You've got to be a great husband. You've got to be a great wife. You've got to love each other. God's going to be the thing that holds it all together. And it would have stayed together. Imagine the kids that could have been changed from that. Wow. Imagine the single mothers who maybe said, it's just too much, I can't do this alone. If they could have came into a kingdom where this little baby could have had aunts and uncles, people who loved them. Right. And then they want to wind up in an orphanage. Yeah. Oh, Great. Imagine the evil spirit that's in that woman who burned her baby. If someone had just casted it out with this. See, God's given us this. And we can cast evil spirits. Let me tell you what's happened to everyone here who's a disciple. Yeah. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You had a spirit in you that made you disobey God. It yeah. made you do wicked things you never wanted to do when you were a child. Yeah. Yeah. And you did them, and it all changed when someone sat down with this. Right? Come on, right? Come on, bro. Come on, That's right. We can change the world if we're willing to accept responsibility for it. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. We're either going to be the problem or we're going to be the solution. I gotta ask you, are you indignant or are you indifferent? Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Oh, what can one person do? I'm just one guy. I'm just, yeah, just here in San Francisco trying to work over here, do this, do that, trying to make a little living. What can I really do? Are you indifferent? Or do you go, you know what? Here am I. Send. Mm, come, come on, bro. Send me out. 
I'm willing to go wherever God calls me to do. See, no decision is decision. You're at war whether you like it or not. It's a war. It's in your home. It's in your heart. Are you willing to fight it for God? Are you willing to take responsibility? Are you willing to be like Nehemiah says, Hey, send me back to Jerusalem. Let me build these burnt walls. I will do it even if it costs me my life. I want to go and build the kingdom of God. Are you willing to do that? My third point. God gathers and God scatters. Turn back to Nehemiah 1. Come on, Jason, we're with you, bro. Yeah. <clears throat> Nehemiah 1, verse 8. He accepts responsibility and he comes up with a plan. Verse 8. Remember the instruction you gave your servant, Moses, saying, If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to this place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand, O Lord. Let your ear be attended to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servants success today by granting favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer. To the king. He takes his life into his hands. He goes before Xerxes that we all saw in the movie 300. <laughs> Scary guy. Yeah, he and he says, let me go back and rebuild my city. God worked. He went back and rebuilt it and Xerxes gave him the supplies to get it done. <laughs> See, but this principle that if we're unfaithful to God, he will scatter us. Yep. But if we are faithful, He will gather us from wherever it may be. Yeah. You know, I got baptized in 1999 in Tampa, Florida, as a true disciple of Jesus, into a movement of God that was having a global impact. Yes. It had a church growth unlike ever seen in all of history, other than the one in the book of Acts. Yeah. And not just the growth of sheer people becoming disciples and geographical expansion, getting to every country in the world that had a population of over 100,000 people, but the sheer power of it, yeah. the power of its leaders, was incredible. Right. Sadly, just four short years after I was baptized into this movement, it came to a crashing halt. People were baffled that how could something that was seemingly so unstoppable be dismantled and scattered so easily and so quickly? For 12 years now, people have tried to figure out what, what did it. Did, was it ambitious leaders? Was it authoritative leaders? Was it autonomy? Was it this? Was it that? How could it have just been disassembled so easily? Something that seemed so indestructible. I can tell you why. And the scripture tells us why. God. Come on, bro. God. There was a divine presence in the scattering of it. No man could have made it happen that quickly, and no man could have dismantled it that quickly. It fulfills the scriptures. God said, if you turn away from me, I will scatter you among the nations. And that's where many, many people sit right now. Just waiting for the next sermon to come out from an ICC church next to them so they can listen to it. Just hunkering down, waiting for some a group of disciples to finally get there. They are scattered. I remember in 2006, I started hearing about a great revival in all places, Portland, Oregon. Come on. Come on. And it was great to go back to Portland this last weekend. Come on, bro. Because people took responsibility like Nehemiah, the great scattering wasn't the end of the story right. in our new movements. It wasn't the end of the story. It was the start of a new beginning. Right. People took responsibility like Kip said, hey, this was my sin. Yes. This is what I did wrong. This is how I turned away from God. People like Kyle Bartholomew and Tim Kernan, Raul Moreno, they took responsibility for where it was. They
they said, but we can change it if we would just turn back to God. Right. There was a revival in Portland. People started coming in from all over the world to Portland. Yeah. Why? Yeah. God. God was gathering them. Yeah. I was one of them. I packed up my car in Tampa, Florida, and moved to Portland. <laughs> and what God was doing was incredible. A movement of true Christians started again. You know, people are looking, man, where was that radical movement I was baptized into? And they found it. Right. 2007, 42 disciples started the church in Los Angeles. And from that one church, it multiplied into churches all over the world. Yeah. God is gathering His people. I just got to ask you, do you see it? Do you see the scriptures happening before our very eyes? Then we are part of the movement of God. What we're going to see happening in the next year is going to baffle us. Amen. It's going to show us the power of God. God is gathering His people from Sydney, Australia to San Francisco. From Moscow to Manila. From Palm Springs to, to Paris. To Los Angeles to London. The scriptures are true. God is faithful. The moment of God is back. And what we do with it is how we respond to the bad news. Come on, bro. Thank you guys very much.